believe everything that was said, you know, dear. I didn't believe any of it. <laughs> that is quite right, dear. I couldn't believe that any woman could really hold such views of life as I have heard tonight from some of your guests. I hear you have such pleasant society in America. Uh, quite like our own places, my son wrote to me. There are cliques in America as elsewhere, Lady Hunstanton, but true American society consists simply of all the good women and good men we have in our country. What a sensible system. And I dare say quite pleasant, too. I'm afraid in England we have too many artificial social barriers. We don't see as much as we should of the middle and lower classes. In America, we have no lower classes. Really? What a very strange arrangement. What is that dreadful girl talking about? She is painfully natural, is she not? There are a great many things you haven't gotten in America, I am told, Miss Worsley. They say you have no ruins and no curiosities. What nonsense! They have their mothers and their manners. The English aristocracy supply us with our curiosities, Lady Caroline. They are sent over to us every summer regularly in the steamers and propose to us the day after they land. As for ruins, we are trying to build up something that will last longer than brick or stone. What is that, dear? Ah, oh, yes. An iron exhibition, is it not? At that place that has the curious name? We are trying to build up life, Lady Hunstanton, on a better, truer, purer basis than life rests on here. This sounds strange to you all, no doubt. How could it sound other than strange? You rich people in England, you don't know how you are living. How could you know? You shut out from your society the gentle and the good. You laugh at the simple and the pure. Living as you all do on others and by them, you sneer at self-sacrifice, and if you throw bread to the poor, it is merely to keep them quiet for a season. With all your pomp and wealth and art, you don't know how to live. You don't even know that. You love the beauty that you can see and touch and handle. The beauty that you can destroy and do destroy. But of the unseen beauty of life, or of the unseen beauty of a higher life, you know nothing. You have lost life's secret. Oh, your English society seems to me shallow, selfish, foolish. It has blinded its eyes and stopped its ears. It lies like a leper in purple. It sits like a dead thing smeared with gold. It is all wrong, all wrong. I don't think one should know of these things. It is not very, very nice, is it? My dear Miss Worsley, I thought you liked English society so much. You were such a success in it. And you were so much admired by the best people. I quite forget what Lord Henry Weston said of you, but it was most complimentary. And you know what an authority he is on beauty. Mrs. Arbuthnot enters unseen from the terrace behind, in a cloak with a lace veil over her head. Lord Henry Weston. I remember him, Lady Hunstanton, a man with a hideous smile and a hideous past. He is asked everywhere. No dinner party is complete without him. What of those whose ruin is due to him? They are outcasts. They are nameless. If you met them in the street, you would turn your head away. I don't complain of their punishment. Let all women who have sinned be punished. My dear young lady. It is right that they should be punished. But don't let them be the only ones to suffer. If a man and woman have sinned, let them both go forth into the desert to love or loathe each other there. Let them both be branded. Set a mark, if you wish, on each, but don't punish the one and let the other go free. Don't have one law for men and another for women. You are unjust to women in England, and till you count what is a shame in a woman to be an infamy in a man, you will always be unjust and right, that pillar of fire, and wrong, that pillar of cloud, will be made dim to your eyes, or be not seen at all, or if seen, not regarded. Might I, dear Miss Worsley, as you are standing up, ask you for my cotton that is just behind you? Thank you. My dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, I am so pleased you have come up, but I didn't hear you announced. 
Oh, I came straight in from the terrace, Lady Hunstanton, just as I was. You didn't tell me you had a party. Not a party. Only a few guests who are staying in the house, and whom you must know. Uh, allow me. Lady Hunstanton rises to help Mrs. Arpin off with her things, while she rings the bell and carries on her conversation. Caroline? This is Mrs. Arbuthnot, one of my sweetest friends, Lady Caroline Pontrefract, Lady Stutfield, Mrs. Allenby, and my young American friend, Miss Worsley, who has just been telling us how wicked we all are. I am afraid you think I spoke too strongly, Lady Hunstanton, but there are some things in England that... My dear young lady, there was a great deal of truth, I dare say, in what you said. And you looked very pretty while you said it, which is much more important, Lord Illingworth would tell us. The only point where I thought you were a little hard was about Lady Caroline's brother, about poor Lord Henry. He is really such good company. Enter Francis, the footman. Take Mrs. Arbuthnot's things. Francis does so and exits. Lady Caroline, I had no idea it was your brother. I am sorry for the pain I must have caused you. I... My dear Miss Worsley. The only part of your little speech, if I may so term it, with which I thoroughly agreed was the part about my brother. Nothing that you could possibly say could be too bad for him. I regard Henry as infamous, absolutely infamous. But I am bound to state, as you were remarking, Jane, that he is excellent company, and he has one of the best cooks in London. After a good dinner, one can forgive anybody, even one's own relations. Now do come, Hester dear, and make friends with Mrs. Arbuthnot. She is one of the good, sweet, simple people you told us we never admitted into society. I am sorry to say Mrs. Arbuthnot comes very rarely to me, but that is not my fault. What a bore it is, the men staying so long after dinner. I expect they are saying the most dreadful things about us. Do you really think so? I'm sure of it. How very, very horrid of them. Shall we go on to the terrace? Oh, anything to get away from the dowagers and the dowdies. Mrs. Allenby rises and goes with Lady Stutfield to the door. We are only going to look at the stars, Lady Hunstanton. You will find a great many, dear, a great many. But don't catch cold. We shall all miss Gerald so much, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. But has Lord Illingworth really offered to make Gerald his secretary? Oh, yes. He's been most charming about it. He has the highest possible opinion of your boy. You don't know Lord Illingworth, I believe, dear? I have never met him. You know him by name, no doubt? I'm afraid I don't. I live so much out of the world and see so few people. I remember hearing years ago of an old Lord Illingworth who lived in Yorkshire, I think. Ah, yes. That would be the last Earl but one. He was a very curious man. He wanted to marry beneath him. Or wouldn't, I believe. There was some scandal about it. The present Lord Illingworth is quite different. He is very distinguished. He does... Well, he does nothing, which I'm afraid our pretty American visitor here thinks very wrong of anybody. And I don't think that he cares much for the subjects in which you are so interested, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot. Do you think, Caroline, that Lord Illingworth is interested in the housing of the poor? I should fancy not at all, Jane. We all have our different tastes, have we not? But Lord Illingworth has a very high position, and there is nothing he couldn't get if he chose to ask for it. Of course, he is a comparatively young man still, and he's only come to his title within, uh, how long exactly is it, Caroline, since Lord Illingworth succeeded? About four years, I think, Jane. I know it was the same year in which my brother had his last exposure in the evening newspapers. I remember. That would be about four years ago. Of course, there were a great many people between the present Lord Illingworth and the title Mrs. Arbuthnot. There was, um, who was there, Caroline? There was poor Margaret's baby. You remember how anxious she was to have a boy. And it was a boy, but it died. And her husband died shortly afterwards. And she married almost immediately one of Lord Ascot's sons, who I am told beats her. Oh, that is in the family, dear. That is in the family. And there was also, I remember, a clergyman who wanted to be a lunatic. 
or a lunatic who wanted to be a clergyman, I forget which. But I know the Court of Chancery investigated the matter and decided he was quite sane. And I saw him afterwards at poor Lord Plumstead's with straws in his hair or something very odd about him. Can't recall what. I often regret, Lady Caroline, that dear Lady Cecilia never lived to see her son get the title. Lady Cecilia? Lord Inningworth's mother, dear Mrs. Arbuthnot, was one of the Duchess of Jerningham's pretty daughters, and she married Sir Thomas Harford, who wasn't considered a very good match for her at the time, though he was said to be the handsomest man in London. I knew them all quite intimately, and both the sons, Arthur and George. It was the eldest son who succeeded, of course, Lady Hunstanton. Oh, no, dear, he was killed in the hunting field. Or was it fishing, Caroline? I forget. But George came in for everything. I always tell him that no younger son has ever had such good luck as he has had. Lady Hunstanton, I want to speak to Gerald at once. Might I see him? Can he be sent for? Certainly, dear. I will send one of the servants into the dining room to fetch him. I don't know what keeps the gentleman so long. <laughs>